Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on making the case for data privacy investment to your CEO and senior management team. My name is John Byrne and I'm a data protection consultant here at Privacy Angel. As I say, you're all very welcome and I hope you're looking forward to today's content. So, just to begin with a fairly high level overview of the problem as it stands, we always like to begin in this way just for context. Well, essentially, as I'm sure you know, personal data is everywhere. And this is really just due to the ever-expanding remit of IoT, AI, and the fact that really at the heart of it all, the vast majority of us deal in personal data in some way, shape, or form as part of our day-to-day -day business function. Now, by result, there's been a proliferation of new data protection and privacy laws across the globe, with the likes of Gartner predicting that by 2023, 65% of the world's population will have its own personal data covered under some kind or form of modern privacy regulation. Now, this has subsequently led to a vast increase in privacy teams, and the question then becomes, how can they demonstrate their compliance against the mandates of their respective jurisdictions' legislation? Now, with that said, perhaps you, in your role as DPO, Chief Privacy Officer, or just Privacy Lead, are trying to get your own organization to join in the ever-growing number of entities out there that are investing in their data protection roadmap. So, it should really be highlighted from the outset that there are really no hard and fast rules when seeking investment for your data protection or privacy program. The nature of these conversations are always dictated by a variety of factors, as I'm sure you can appreciate, not least of which being your organization's appetite for risk. Now, in saying that, there are some broader items that you can always incorporate to make this process more streamlined and to ensure the appropriate level of impact when putting forward the request. And that's what we'll be aiming to cover in today's presentation. So in brief summary, we'll really be looking at four key elements today. Chief amongst which is understanding your organization, then moving on to your audience, Three is highlighting the wider business utility of a given project. And of course, being able to put together an effective and concise business case. So with that said, let's keep going. So just starting off with the organization itself, I really can't highlight enough the need to understand your organization and its primary goals and objectives. You will have an extremely difficult time, um, admittedly, if you're seeking investment and you don't understand the business you're in. Now, a typical issue we do come across ourselves is privacy professionals purely looking at their business from the viewpoint of compliance, without really understanding or taking into account the other intertwined elements of the business and how best that they can actually balance both interests. Now, as a starting point, and particularly if you're actually reasonably new to your business, for example, it's always good to check how your organization portrays itself on its website and to the wider public. Is it dominated by endorsements and sales figures on its website? Or does it instead focus on promoting its ethical objectives and sustainable business practices? Now for the typical commercial entity and those who fall within that first category I mentioned, compliance can often be seen as a barrier to progress. New tools and technologies that further leverage personal data and that help generate revenue may often trump the recommendations made by privacy professionals within that domain. Being aware of the primary business objective allows you to prime your pitch accordingly. Now, I say the word pitch, and I'll come back to that in due course. As I say, this can be a fairly difficult barrier to overcome if you're coming into it blind, as while management may immediately view Whatever your project may be in black and white, particularly in terms of whether or not a particular um, piece of functionality can go ahead, it's very rarely the case that functionality or a given project or objective can't be tweaked to create a blend of increased utility and compliance. You yourself just have to be in a position to demonstrate how that can actually be achieved. Now, in that particular example that I've just given, the increased investment you might be looking for could potentially be the likes of say an additional resource internally to assist in the process of conducting a DPIA 
or perhaps you maybe want to fund additional training for the potential business owner of that new process to ensure that they're aware of their obligations from the outset. Now, admittedly, this can be quite a, um, I struggle for any other word than boring, really, um, line of conversation to have with senior management, particularly if they're not overly enthused by the program from the outset. But that kind of brings me on to my next point, and we'll just look at that now on the next slide. So, step two, knowing your audience. So you understand your business and you have a strong sense of its underlying objectives. Now you have to consider the people you're actually dealing with. At the end of the day, compliance really isn't entirely unlike sales, and there is a good degree of psychology involved. Now, there is an excellent book that many of you may already be familiar with uh, called How to Be a Wildly Effective Compliance Officer, written by Christy Grant Hart. Now, one particular chapter of that book outlines the four categories of business owners that you will typically deal with as part of your role in compliance. From a high level overview, it's broken into the, the following categorizations. Those individuals most motivated by fear for themselves, those motivated by fear for the company or the business, those motivated by corporate social responsibility and ethical approaches, and finally, probably the most common, those motivated by competitive edge. This breakdown, while in no way an exhaustive categorization, can be very helpful when assessing how best to seek investment from senior management. Going to reach from a high level, if we were to look at that first category, those that are motivated by fear for themselves. These individuals would typically be influenced by the likes of fines and penalties leveraged against directors and board members for breach of an obligation. If we take the UK as an immediate example, the Companies Act 2006 imbues a duty on directors to exercise reasonable care, skill and due diligence whilst conducting their roles. Where boards fail to adequately make provision for an organisation's data protection programme, this in turn may leave them in breach of this duty and may result in penalties. To bring this a little bit closer to home, if you look at section 146 of the Irish Data Protection Act, there is clear scope for enforcement against individual directors and other members of senior management where an offence has been committed through the consent, connivance or neglect of the individual or group of individuals at board level. The goal here really is to make I suppose a previously imposed penalty where available as directly comparable to the individual in question. This may seem somewhat cruel from the outset, um, but realistically speaking, your goal here is to highlight the necessity for investment. And being able to highlight how lack of same can have an immediate knock-on effect for those with sign-off ability, it can be a highly effective tool and some, certainly something to be utilised. If you even look at some of the mandated requirements within the GDPR, for example, looking at Article 38 of, of uh, the legislation, this outlines the requirement for data controllers and data processors to ensure their DPO is afforded the appropriate level of funding to conduct that function. Should the business fail to do so, and at the discretion of the board, this may leave the individual directors liable. So just something to bear in mind if you've designated a particular stakeholder as falling within this category. The next group that we're looking at would be those motivated by their level of investment in the company. They're typically driven by love of the business that they're in, um, and they really just have an outright fear of the business falling into disrepute through the likes of a public fine by the regulator. As we'll all know, loss of reputation is generally far more detrimental to a business than the fiscal loss. And we don't have to look any further than WhatsApp's recent fine um, to kind of see this in practice. If you look at that particular um, penalty, the amount itself, while fairly substantial from the outset, it's nothing when you compare it to the reputational damage that yet another interaction with the regulator has had on Facebook share value. Just as a point of note, you probably all have seen this as well in the press, it subsequently plummeted 5% overnight once that fine hit the tabloids. So, similar to the previous category, it's really best that you focus on similar organisations subject to similar fines or complications or reputational loss when you're seeking to further 
I suppose, imbibe investment within your given program and take those concerns to a stakeholder that, that's most uh, easily assuaded by them. If we move on now to the third type of stakeholder, those primarily motivated by ethical and socially responsible business practices, realistically speaking, you probably won't have as much difficulty seeking investment from this category of individual. When you think about it, at the heart of it, your data protection roadmap will probably gel fairly well alongside the other myriad objectives held close to their own hearts. At the end of the day, data protection and privacy legislation is tasked with the upholding of fundamental human rights. So for those interested in corporate social responsibility, ensuring the appropriate funding of compliance in this space will fit hand in glove. It's really just a matter then of pitching well, and once again I say pitch, and ensuring that the request is tactical and capable of providing the results that are needed in a fairly easily showcased fashion. Finally, how best to pitch to those that are primarily driven by having an edge against the competition? Well, if we take a page out of Apple's book here. For years now, Apple's been leveraging their strides in the privacy space to drive sales and increase their stock value. Think back to last year even, when the company announced that they would be incorporating detection and blocking capability into iOS devices, and the effect this had on the media, platform providers such as Facebook, and ultimately their share value. Needless to say, the public is becoming more and more aware of their rights under data protection and privacy legislation across the globe, and those individuals, those key stakeholders who realize this early, are typically best positioned to benefit. If your senior management fall within this category, make sure to align your program's objectives with the commercial aspect of the business wherever possible. If you even think of the likes of ISO 27001, implementation of this security standard internally, it comes at a cost, but in terms of time and funding. However, once implemented, it becomes an extremely valuable tool for garnering new business as it's now become a core requirement for tenders at certain commercial levels. As I say, a fairly high level of categorization of the individual stakeholders, but certainly something to bear in mind. Moving on now to step three, it's highlighting the general business utility that comes with taking your steer and funding your program appropriately. Now, step three, needless to say, has intrinsic synergy with step two, and that is really just highlighting how there is intrinsic overlap between the two different elements of the business versus your compliance program. You'll see here a quote from Cisco's data privacy benchmark study from last year. Over the past few years, data privacy has evolved from a nice to have to a business imperative and critical boardroom issue. Now we're constantly seeing through our clients the benefits of increased investment in this area and that's certainly something that's reflected in this and many other reports available to us all. Typically speaking this tends to express itself in a number of ways, chief amongst which being an increase in operational efficiency, innovation allowing for the provision of services with less data and subsequently less liability, an increased appeal for investors who are now also becoming perfectly aware of this trend and an increase in overall brand value and so much more. Those are the high level points. However, from a practical perspective, there's also such a plethora of benefits that come with increased investment within a data protection program. If we look at efficiency, uh, just by way of example here, if you invest in your process reviews, it'll also streamline those processes by cutting down on any unnecessary personal data from the outset. This can result in shorter application forms for your clients, reduced review processes, reduced local or cloud storage requirements, and so much more. Next up is the customer experience. By understanding the personal data within your domain and how it can be leveraged to the maximum extent in a compliant manner, one of the many benefits is that experienced by your customers, members, or subscribers. Now let's look at risk management. Investing in your data protection program feeds into the business's wider risk mitigation capability. 
be that through the purchase of new platforms offering robust functionality, or through the upskilling of staff who are then better able to identify and more readily mitigate those risks in an informed manner. Data quality is certainly something we can't leave out either. Perhaps you want to push for what we refer to as a principle four campaign and begin the arduous though highly beneficial process of cleansing your current data set. This requires time and resources to achieve, no doubt, but it will leave the organization in a position to readily stand over the personal data within its domain. This in turn results in better marketing campaigns and an increased likelihood of assessing a given campaign's efficacy, just by a short way of example. Finally then, and as I say, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but if we look at security, there's an intrinsic overlap between data protection and information security. We all know from the data protection aspect, Article 32 imbues a requirement to have standard operating procedures, technical security, and so on and so forth. But as we also saw through a recent UK cybersecurity report, for businesses within the scope of that given review, over 63% of incidents or breaches were actually identified by staff members, as opposed to via the likes of, say, malware detection or routine internal security monitoring. This is actually a fairly impressive figure when you think about it, and it shows that investment in staff awareness pays dividends and may reduce the overall impact of a data breach simply by being able to catch it early. These are all valid points that you can bring to your senior management when seeking further investment. Moving on to step four, finally. Now, the data protection community and privacy community for that matter, as I'm sure you will all agree, is a wonderfully diverse and varied group of individuals. Now, you may have come into your own role as DPO, CPO, or DP lead through any number of avenues, be that a pre-existing compliance role such as AML, maybe you're coming from a legal background, or maybe you've come through from the likes of HR, IT, or maybe even a sales background. For many, the concept of putting together a business case will be second nature, for others maybe not. Perhaps the approach taken to date falls somewhere along the lines of, if we don't do this or um, remedy that, we'll be in breach of the legislation and we might face a fine or reputational damage. And that's about as deep as it goes. This can be effective for certain elements of compliance, uh, particularly where you can show that the regulator in your jurisdiction is actively enforcing a given area. Here in Ireland, a prime example of this would be last October's cookie sweep and deadline imposed by the DPC. Many DPOs got instant buy-in simply because this is an area of compliance that's immediately front-facing and had to be addressed for fear of penalty. Generally speaking though, this is certainly not the best approach to take, um, I would recommend, and that you should always aim to create a business case for any investment sought. This doesn't necessarily have to be an overly laborious process. You're not expected to bring in stacks and stacks of uh, documentation to highlight the problem and the concerns and everything else in between. You really just want to convey the problem effectively, along with a couple of viable options for remediation, how those options align with the business, that's current objectives, of course, the risks involved for either side of the breakdown, and ultimately then a description of the costs and timeline involved. At the end of the day, senior management, as we'll all know, um, particularly if you're sitting within a senior management role by, de by default as part of your own role, we've limited time. So the more concise that you can actually be with this process, generally speaking, the better. It's also worth highlighting the need for clarity when you're putting these proposals together. While a great deal of data protection related projects are easily explained and understood, there are an equal number of complex issues that, to the less informed, will need to be explained carefully to ensure the appropriate level of impact and understanding. If you take the likes of international transfers, for example, this is a common headache for data protection professionals in just about any jurisdiction. Trying to develop a standard operating procedure for this element of compliance, in addition to the new slew of standard contractual clauses, for example, and what it is they do and do not cover, that can be difficult to say the least for a lot of organizations. 
Now you might bring in software, incorporating vendor management tools and questionnaires that can make this task considerably easier. But in order to seek investment in the first instance, you have to be able to outline the problem concisely and how investment will streamline business utility. So, I hope this has been helpful, folks. I'm just going to move on very briefly and touch on ourselves here at Privacy Engine. As many of you here attending on the call will know, our organization provides specialized data protection and consultancy software and services. We've been around since 2016. Uh, we've had the pleasure of working with clients in over 40 jurisdictions around the world. Our platform itself, of the same name, has over 20,000 active users and has been successfully deployed in over 300 companies to date. To say we have a passion for data protection and privacy would be an understatement. But with that passion also comes awareness of some of the typical struggles our customers do face on a regular basis when seeking additional investment in their data protection and privacy programs. I truly hope that today's webinar has provided some insight and potentially a few new avenues for managing this issue. But otherwise, I would just like to thank you for your time I very much look forward to seeing you again for the next one.